Uh, good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Sir, um, can I ask that um, Mr. Dunks isn't sworn for the moment? I know that his legal representative wants to um, provide me with a piece of paper that sets out a correction that Mr. Dunks wants to make to his witness statement, and yeah. he hasn't given me that yet. That's fine. Can I call Andy Dunks, please? Yeah. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Dunks. My name is uh, Jason Beer. I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Before I ask you those questions, uh, there's a, a matter that the chairman uh, will raise with you. Mr. Dunks, <coughs> under our law, a witness at a public inquiry has the right to decline to answer a question put to him by counsel to the inquiry, by any recognized legal representative, or by me if there is a risk that the answer to that question would incriminate the witness. This legal principle is known in shorthand form as the privilege against self-incrimination. I take the view that fairness demands that I remind you of that privilege before you give your evidence. If at any stage you wish to rely upon that privilege, however, it is for you to alert me of that fact. If, therefore, any questions are put to you by any of the lawyers who ask you questions, or by me, which you do not wish to un answer on the ground that to answer such a question might incriminate you, you must tell me immediately after the question is put to you. At that point, I will consider your objection and thereafter rule upon whether your objection to answering the question should be upheld. Now, I think I understand correctly that you are represented today by lawyers at the inquiry. Is that right? Yes. So if the issue relating to self-incrimination arises and you wish them to assist you, and if at any stage during the questioning you wish to consult your lawyers about the privilege, you must tell me so that I can consider whether that is appropriate. Do you understand all that, Mr Dunks? I do, yes. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mr Beer. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr Dunks, uh, can you give us your full name, please? Andrew Paul Dunks. Uh, you last gave evidence on the 8th of March 2023 for um, half a day before... Um, the weather interrupted us in phase uh, three of the inquiry. Since then, you've prepared a second witness statement, the URN uh, for which is WITN 00300200. It's 69 pages long, and it's dated the 24th of May 2024. I think there are two corrections that you wish to make to it. Is that right? Yes. Uh, can we deal with the first of them, which <coughs> is more substantial, uh, by looking at um, page... 23 of the witness statement, if that could be brought up on the screen. So second witness statement, page 23, and if you look in the hard copy in front of you. <coughs> Have you got that? I've got it here, not in, 
not paid in the in front. Uh, paragraph 77. We scroll down, please. Uh, you say in that uh, paragraph, I do not know why system event logs were not supplied as part of the ARQ process. Um, is um, uh, there a correction which you wish to make to that? Yes, there is. Is the correction, I'm going to read it out um, at dictation speed. Um, it, it's quite long. Do you wish to make the following correction? I have now been shown records which indicate that as part of the ARQ process, the CSPOA security team, including me, supplied the system events log to the SSC to check them for any financial implications. And then you give a reference, e.g. FUJ 0018-6421. And then you add, though I now have no recollection of this. Correct. Is that the correction you wish to make? It is, yes. So I have now been shown records which indicate that as part of the ARQ process, the security team, including me, supplied the system events log to the SSC to check them for any financial implications, though I now have no recollection of this. Correct. And then the um, second correction, please, uh, much simpler, page 52 of the witness statement. Uh, paragraph 167. <clears throat> In the first line, you say, it appears that I was asked to provide litigation support in respect of this prosecution in August 2006. Do you wish to amend that to May 2006? I do, yeah. And is that because you have um, now seen a document which has got your name on it, which um, is dated from um, May 2006? Yes. Thank you. Can you go to the last page, please, uh, which is the uh, page 69 of the witness statement? Is that your signature? It is, yes. And with those two corrections brought into account, are the contents of the witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is, yes. Thank you very much. No, I'm not going to, that can come down, thank you, and you can put the witness statement uh, to one side. I'm not going to address um, your uh, background, uh, your work at Fujitsu, um, or the organization of the customer service post office account, the CSPOA, uh, and in particular the security team within it, as you address those issues on the last occasion, and you provide considerable detail about them in your most recent witness statement. Uh, you say in that recent witness statement that um, as of the 24th of May um, 2024, uh, you remained employed by Fujitsu as an IT security analyst in the security team. Does that remain the case? Yes. It, yes. Uh, can I be, begin with um, what might be described as some process um, issues? <coughs> you refer in your witness statement to the post office accounts prosecution support section, the P, P, uh, PSS. Yes? Yes. Can you confirm that that entity, the prosecution support section, was not part of the post office, it was part of Fujitsu? Um, where about, I don't know, sorry. Um, I believe so, yes. Okay. Was there anyone embedded from the post office in it? No, there wasn't. Can we look at a policy document, please? FUJ 0015-2209. It will come up on the screen for you. Uh, 
Uh, can you see um, this is a document, the title of which is Network Banking Management of Prosecution Support. Yes. The date of it in the top right is version two, is dated the 29th of February 2005. Um, a summary of it under the um, title abstract is given. It outlines the end-to-end -end procedures required to manage and deliver the network banking prosecution support service, prosecution support service. Can you see that? Yes. This is a document that you refer to um, in your witness statement. And if we just pan out a little bit to look at the whole of the front page, I don't think we see your name on it. Is that right? Yes. And then if we look at the second page, I don't think we see your name as a, um, a reviewer, either mandatory or optional, or a person to whom it was issued for information. Can you see that? Yes. Would that reflect the fact that um, the level at which you operated meant that you didn't contribute towards documents of the, this kind? Correct, yes. If we go back to page one, please. And uh, if we scroll down a little bit. Thank you. Uh, you'll be familiar with a number of the names um, of the contributors there. Would that be right? Yes. Um, of the contributors, uh, can you tell us, uh, as at 2005, what they did and what their relationship to the work that you did was? <clears throat> um, Naina Lowther was part of the, uh, the same level as I was uh, in the, within the security team, uh, and she carried uh, out or looked after, I believe at the time, um, ARQ requests along with other um, jobs within our, our team. Bill Mitchell was the security manager, which would have been our line manager. Um, Penny Thomas would have been the same level as myself and Nana. Um, I'm not sure what her role then, whether she had become uh, the litigation uh, manager. Jan Holmes and Alan Holmes. This is where I, I, I get confused because they've both got the same surname. <clears throat> I think one... If we just go to page two to help you. And scroll down. We can see um, Jan Holmes is described as the quality assurance yeah. manager yeah, and well, Alan Holmes is described as audit. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. One was like a service, I believe... I. The role was around a uh, service delivery manager, that would have been Jan, and Alan Holmes was audit support. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this document, which sets out the procedures required to manage and deliver the prosecution support service, is this a document you would have been familiar with back in the day, back in 2005? Um, familiar with? Uh, I don't know. I, I would have probably read it at one stage. Um, but how, come, how were uh, documents um, distributed to users of them at that time? Uh, I can't remember how they were distributed back, back then. Was there a centralised library, um, sort of an intranet, that was a depository, repository of policies that you were able to access or expected to access? Or were documents physically passed to you? Oh, no, yeah, I don't believe they were physically <coughs> passed to us, but they, they would have been available if needed. OK, so this is the kind of document that would have set out the procedures to be operated for prosecution support, mm -hmm. the prosecution support service in 2005. And just again, looking at the um, uh, reviewers, and if we go back to page one, the contributors. Uh, scroll down, thank you. Would you agree that um, this um, is an internal Fujitsu document to which post office did not apparently contribute? 
It appears so, yes. Uh, all of the contributors are uh, and reviewers are Fujitsu employees rather than post office employees. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Do you know the extent to which post office was um, given the opportunity to comment on or amend or provide contributions to policies of this kind? No, I have no idea what, what level or whether they, what documents they were aware of or saw, no. Okay. That was something that happened, if it happened, above your level, is that right? Correct, yes. Thank you. Uh, can we go to page 22 of the document, please? Can you see, um, if we just scroll down, please, um, under 7.2.4, it provides um, complete witness statement of fact. Uh, the prosecution support service, PSS, will provide a witness statement of fact in respect of 250 ARQs per annum. This will, as far as possible, be undertaken by the person responsible for the actioning of the work so as to retain continuity of evidence and obviate the need for additional statements. And um, just on the point, um, the provision of the witness statement will be undertaken by the person as far as is possible who was responsible for undertaking the ARQ work uh, described earlier in 7.1. That, I think, accords with what you tell us in the witness statement. If you did the extraction, then you were the provider of the witness statements. Is yes. that right? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it continues, 7.2.4.1, uh, um, any material or otherwise pertinent information shall be uh, recorded and included in the relevant witness statement of fact. Uh, requirements for witness statements explaining the extraction of audit data from Horizon in response to an ARQ shall be completed by the individual from PSS who completed the request. That's um, the same point as is made in 7.2.4. It continues, the statement shall follow the standard format and layout for witness statements of fact provided in evidence. Uh, contents of witness statement of fact are flexible depending on specific requirements of each case and the knowledge of the witness giving the statement. An example um, of a witness statement of fact is provided in Appendix 2. Uh, for each request, post office and prosecution support will agree relevant matters, such as those listed below, which should be covered in the witness statement of fact based on the knowledge of um, the witness. And if we read on, we can see that those matters include, um, I mean, if you just read the first five there, And if we go over the page, please, to the fourth bullet point on that page, uh, matters which should be covered in the witness statement of fact include bullet point four, the process for extracting information for ARQs and the controls in place to ensure the integrity of that data. And then the fifth bullet point, an analysis of the ARQ when the ARQ form was received and the dates when the audit data extraction took place. These, uh, this shall be taken from the prosecution support database and audit trail file. And then lastly, a summary of the evidence provided for um, the request. So was it right that the post office's only role was in relation to ARQs, identifying the relevant matters, i.e. which of these bullet points needed to be addressed in a witness statement. So, sorry. Yeah, if you just go, if we go back, please. And scroll up, please. You see the third paragraph there, four lines in. It reads, for each request, post office and the prosecution support service will agree relevant matters such as those listed below which should be covered in the witness statement of fact. So was it the post office's role to agree with prosecution support which of the bullet points that are listed 
needed to be addressed in a witness statement? I don't know at, at that level. Um, I'm not quite sure. What did you, when you, and we know that you made many, many witness statements, mm -hmm. uh, what did you take as your um, guide, if any, as to what to include? In the data that we supplied? Or the no, in the statement? witness statement. Um, from our witness template that would have been given to use. Okay. The witness template, we're going to come on and look at it in a minute, has got a number of paragraphs in it that have a capital letter, A through Q, I think, which some of which are optional. Okay. Well, um, it's your evidence, not mine, that's in, in, important. I don't give any evidence at all. Um, the witness statement, the template, appears to include a number of paragraphs that are optional. Does that reflect your understanding? Um, optional? I don't know. I don't, I don't recall that. We in the inquiry have seen a number of um, emails from um, either within Fujitsu or from post office to Fujitsu where they say include paragraphs D, Q, and R, well, D, F, and Q. No need to address K and L. No, I'm not aware of, of, of that, that taking place, no. If we... Um, uh, go forwards to page 29... and uh, scroll down. I'm actually going to look at this in an earlier iteration of the policy in a moment, but if we scroll down, please. This is the template. You remember that the body of the policy said there's an example witness statement in Appendix 2, and this is Appendix 2. And can you see that each paragraph is um, starting um, above the body of the paragraph with a capital letter? Yes. Can you see that? Yes. And if we go over the page, can we see some more? Yes? Yes. And if we scroll on and keep scrolling, you'll see that there's some more paragraphs, each with a capital letter above them. What did you understand the capital letters were for? It's, it's difficult. I don't, I don't remember whether I read this document or I, if I ever used it to reference. So I wasn't aware <clears throat> how the witness statements were generated, who drafted them and how they were drafted. Um, but you, you, you drafted them, didn't you? The witness statements? Not the template, no. Okay, the witness statements that you eventually put your name to and signed? Yes. Um, you decided what went into those, did you? No, we used the t the, a, a template that we, we were told to use within right. the team. The litigation support said this is the template to use, fill in the appropriate information to accompany the ARQ data, and that's what we did. Where was the template kept? Um, in this, I believe in a shared folder. Uh, was that a prosecution service support shared folder within your security team? Um, yeah, I believe so, yes. And so... I don't suppose now you can help us as to whether it looks like this document or not. No, I'm afraid not, sir. Okay. If we go back, please, to uh, page 22 and scroll down. The highlighted part at the bottom, if for each request, post office and prosecution support will agree the relevant matters 
uh, such as those listed below, which should be covered in the witness statement of facts. I think, Mr. Dunks, but maybe you can confirm if this is correct, that did not accord with um, what happened in practice. You included what was on the template rather than what the post office and Fujitsu would agree should be covered in the witness statement. Um, yes, yeah. Would you always use the whole of the template or would you ever say that paragraph isn't relevant to the thing that I'm speaking about on this case, I'll cut that paragraph out? I don't believe that happened, no. I was basing, would use the template that had been agreed within the team or litigation support advisors to use. So you, you don't remember a stage of the process where Post Office and Fujitsu came to an agreement on what needed to be covered off in a witness statement. You just pulled the template from the shared drive, populated it with the data that applied to the ARQs that you were talking about and then signed it, is that right? And basically, yes. Okay. Can we move forwards, please, to page 25? And look at paragraph 8.2. Um, expert witness statement is the heading. Um, in the second uh, paragraph there, the policy says it's conceivable that given the size and complexity of the horizon system, the integrity of the witness statements of fact may be challenged by defense counsel in order to discredit a prosecution. In these cases, additional granular detail about the technical working and integrity of various systems that constitute the horizon system may be required if only for, quote, unused material. Expert witnesses can comprise anyone within the post office account or its approved contractors who could be called upon to provide and testify to this additional evidence. Expert witnesses could be called upon to provide, for example, and then the, the first one is operational logs. And the last one is um, subsequent analysis of this data. Were you aware of, never mind the detail of what this says, but the sense of what these paragraphs say, that as well as what are described as witness statements of fact, there was a facility for expert witness statements to be provided? No. No, I, I don't think I was ever made aware of anything like that, no. Was that language in use at the time in Fujitsu in the support service Mr X or Miss Y probably by their first name is providing a witness statement of fact or in this case because there's been a challenge we need an expert witness statement no not that I'm aware of I don't I don't recall anything like that taking place um, within the team at any time no You'll see that it says expert witnesses can comprise anyone within the post office account. Can you see that? Yes. Were you ever told that you were a person that could provide um, uh, evidence that would be classed as expert witness evidence? No. No, no one, did, uh, as far as I'm aware, described me as an expert witness. Can we go, uh, that can come down, thank you. Can we go to your witness statement, please, your second witness statement? It'll come up on the screen at page 17.
uh, paragraph 53. You say, I and the other security analysts assisted the litigation support manager as and when required, in addition to performing the other tasks assigned to us by the operational security manager. We were very process driven and followed local work instruction documents. That's what I'm going to be concentrating on in a moment, Mr. Dunks. For many of the tasks that we performed, rather than consulting, the Fujitsu policies and service descriptions. The local uh, work instructions were informal documents, which at some stage had been written by those actually performing the tasks and which focused on the practicalities of how to do each task. I believe Penny Thomas drafted local work instructions in respect of ARQ extractions, and I wrote the local work instruction in respect of how to extract the HSD call records, though both documents may have been updated by different people over the years. Uh, none of these local work instructions that I used on a day-to-day -day basis have been disclosed to me by the inquiry. I should say that's because we haven't got them. So you tell us here that um, there were things that you call local work instructions. Uh, and that they were not, um, that they were used rather than Fujitsu policies and service descriptions, is that right? Yes, correct. In the drafting of them, were they based on the Fujitsu policy or service descriptions? Um... I don't know. Uh, they were... That I don't know. Did you create these documents, you within the um, security team, of your own initiative? On the HSD calls, because um, that's the ones I, I would have done, I, I can't remember whether it was off my own initiative or I was asked by the manager to create that working stage work instructions so other people within the team could perform the same task. Uh, so if there had been a tasking, it would have been by your manager, is that right? Yes, uh, yeah, yes. Did any managers improve, approve the local work instructions? I don't remember that happening, no. And can you help us as to why a manager may not have approved the local work instructions? No, I don't know why. Um, you see, we, we've got a suite of documents, and there are a lot of them. Yes which are Fujitsu policies, which say how your work is to be undertaken. Yes, I've just showed you one of them. Yes. And you tell us here that instead of using those, you were relying on some local work instructions. Yes. And I'm trying to find out who signed those off, rather than the formal policy documents that all sorts of people had reviewed, contributed to, and quality assured. Well. I can only say my experience of the, of the... I created many, many work instructions to do with my main role, which is the key management. Um, because, again, there were vast documents explaining things and how things worked within the key management arena. Um, and for... Instead of keep referring to that, we'd take the, the instructions and create... Uh, the local work instructions for somebody who could come along and perform that task in an easier step-by-step, -step, and that's what we class as local work instructions. To what extent were they based on the requirements of Fujitsu policies, like the one I've just shown you? I have no idea, actually. 
they would they, they would have taken information from that. Um, was any consideration given to we've got we're drafting up a local working instruction on how to extract and put into a witness statement information about um, help desk calls? Any consideration given to what does our policy, our company policy, say about that? Uh, I can't say for the ARQ local work instructions, but um, no, I don't believe it. From my point of view, from the HSD call extraction, no. On your document, the one that you tell us here that you drafted, can you help us? Did it say anything about whether the uh, help desk calls that you were obtaining should be summarised in the witness statement to which the case related? No, it, no. It, it was purely the, the actions of requesting and downloading the help desk calls. So it was quite practical about how to go about, is this right, the um, extraction of the help desk calls? Correct. It didn't say what you then did with that data? No. So it didn't say you must exhibit it to a witness statement, the download? Yeah, no, it didn't. It didn't say you must summarise it in your witness statement? No, it didn't. It didn't say you should or you should not seek to analyse what the data means? No, it didn't. It, is this right? It didn't say if um, you're unsure about what an entry on the HSD log means, it's permissible or not permissible to go and speak to the SSC about that to get an explanation? No, it didn't, no. And that if you get an explanation, you should record that fact in the witness statement? No, it didn't. So it didn't speak about any of the, um, from our perspective, the important things of what goes into the witness statement? No, it didn't, no. Was there any document that um, regulated or regularised what went into a witness statement? Let's stick with HSD calls. I don't believe so, no. You understand that you could do it in different ways, couldn't you? You could say, I'm Andrew Dunks. On Monday the 1st of January, I extracted 120 calls in relation to this branch between these two date parameters from the HSD. I exhibit them as my exhibit AD1. That's one way of doing it, isn't it? Sorry, you're saying would that have been part of the instructions? No, that, that could be a way of doing it. Yes. Another way could be um, making a witness statement which said, um, I'm Andrew Dunks, and um, I accessed and read the calls, and I've cut and pasted a summary of them into my witness statement. That would be another way of doing it, wouldn't it? Yes, it would have been. And another way of doing it would be to add, on the end of either of those two, some analysis of uh, what those calls meant. Yes. And by analysis, I mean offer an opinion on what they mean. Yes. What the entries mean. And offer an opinion over whether the content of any of the calls related to the integrity of the data being processed by Horizon. Yes. Was there any instruction at all that you were aware of that told you um, which of those things you um, should do or which of those things you shouldn't do? Written in, written in instruction. To no. start with, yes, written instruction. Yes, no. Because in a moment we're going to see that you, over time, you did all three of those things in different cases. Was there any oral instruction that told you when you're summarising, or sorry, when you're dealing with HSD data, this is the way to do it in a witness statement? I don't recall instructions um, how about advice or guidance no not advice and guidance no thank you 
okay, that can come down. Can I turn to the issue of um, the extent to which you um, extracted ARQ data and um, the extent to which you gave evidence, i.e. the scale of the enterprise that you were engaged in? Um, you tell us in your witness statement, that I'm summarizing here, that firstly, you held limited technical knowledge of the operation of Horizon, is that correct? Yes. Secondly, that you had limited knowledge of bugs, errors, and defects in the Horizon system. Is that correct? Yes. And thirdly, that you had no um, uh, role in, and you did not uh, and never had worked, in um, HSD, the help desk. Correct. Is that correct? Can we look at paragraph 20 of your first witness statement, please, which is WITN 00. 30100 and can we look please um, on page 6 at paragraph 20 Can you see that on the screen? I can. You say, um, on occasion, and it's going to be those words that I'm going to be focusing on in a moment, Mr. Dunn. On occasion, I was requested to provide the post office with records of calls made to the HSD by a particular post office branch, and if requested, to summarize these in witness statements. While therefore, Sorry, while I therefore did have access to the historic HSD call records, I'd only be looking at them when requested to do so as part of this task. I wasn't a party to the calls themselves and had no role in investigating any errors um, or communicating with the system users um, uh, about them. Uh, can you confirm that that accurately uh, records the extent of your role in the provision of witness statements um, concerning uh, calls to the help desk? Yes. Would you agree that what you're describing there is a purely procedural, um, administrative or mechanical one, i.e. Um, extracting the data, but also then summarizing them in the witness statements? Yes. But would you um, describe the function that you were performing as a limited function? Limited, yeah, yes. But would it be right that you didn't have the technical expertise to interrogate whether the Horizon system was operating as it should at the relevant time? Sorry, say that again. Yes. Would it be right that you didn't have the technical expertise to interrogate whether the Horizon system was operating as it should at the relevant time? Um, in respect to the help desk calls, I, had, I believe I had a, a, a enough knowledge to be able to do that, yes. Enough knowledge to what? Say whether the, what was recorded on the calls meant that either the Horizon system was or was not operating as it should? Um, I had enough knowledge to understand, uh, well, uh, during my looking at the calls, investigating the calls, I believe I gained enough knowledge to, uh, to satisfy myself to make that sort of statement, yes. When you made that kind of statement, whether the horizon system was operating as it should or not, um, by reference to the help desk calls, you were offering an opinion, weren't you? Yes, I was. You weren't making a statement of fact. Yes. Uh, can we go, please, to poll four zeros, three, two, one, nine.
this is a spreadsheet. Ah, oh, thank you. This is um, a spreadsheet disclosed to the inquiry by um, the post office. Um, it appears to be a record prepared by Fujitsu um, of uh, the dates that requests for work were received, um, whether a statement was required in relation to each case, and uh, if so, who prepared it, and whether the statement had been posted out or not. Uh, it, um, the document runs from the 5th of April 2004 to the 22nd of March 2005, so just under um, a, a year. Um, if we look at the column F, can you see that? Yes. And if we just go to the drop down, thank you. Thank you. It, you'll see that in a number of um, rows, for example, 10 and 11 and 24 onwards, um, something has been redacted. Can you see that? Yes. I, I think before we, we got the, the document. We understand that to indicate whether or not a witness statement was um, uh, required. But, um, and therefore I can't um, uh, say one way or the other what was populated in column F. But, um, if we go further to the right, to column um, N, that's it, keep going, thank you. Thank you, and then if we scroll down, um, you see, for example, there, Penny Thomas's name, um, under a checked by uh, box appears. And if we just look at the drop down, just um, look at the drop down once more. Thank you. You'll see that you're one of the people who can be ticked. Can you see that? Yes. Was that essentially the team there? Uh, yes, it was. Okay. Y your name. Um, we've counted them up, appears in um, 98 different lines in this um, column between um, the 17th of August 2004 and the 9th of March 2005. So a six or seven month period, you have had input on 98 requests from the post office. Yes. Um, the checks by, um, was there a process of checking something? These checks were, if I remember correctly, for the ARQ data. Um, and once someone had extracted the data, they performed their checks. Uh, the dates and the data looked OK. And, 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 and before it was sent to post office, a member of the team whoever was available, so there's no formal, um, would run, get asked to run their eyes over it to double check before it was sent to the post office. And that's who would have been put in there. And so would the checks by be the same person that had done the extraction? No. It would be a different person? Yes. Okay. So over this six or seven month period, you have checked some 89 requests from post office. Um, would that sound about right to you? About a hundred over a six or uh, seven month period? No, I don't, I don't know. It could have been, it, it varied. It could have been more, it could have been less over the years. I, I can't say that that sounds about right, but. What proportion of um, ARQ res requests resulted in the request for the production of a witness statement? I have no idea. Can you help us whether it was always or Oh, no, no, in, no. Infrequently? As far as, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, sorry. 
as far as I'm aware, it was quite infrequent. If we just go to the um, uh, top of the page. Thank you, and look at column O, again on um, witness statement required. Look at the drop down. We can see that's been redacted in mm -hmm. each um, column. Yes. So I don't think we can tell the proportion of cases in which a witness statement was um, uh, required. How regularly were you providing witness statements? Again, quite, I don't know, quite in, in, for, for oh, this is to do with ARQs, quite infrequently. So um, over a year, how many would you provide? Uh, from memory, I have no idea. It could be half a dozen. It could, I, 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 I don't, I honestly can't. Remember. And would you always do it the same way, by pulling up the template from the shared drive? Yes. You remember in your witness statement, you said, um, on occasion I was requested to provide the post office with records of calls made to HSD. Is that right? It was only on occasion that you were asked to provide call records? Um, yes, it wasn't, yeah. Again, how many times a year? Well, again, I, I, I don't know. It would have varied from year to year, but it wasn't large. I, though I remember, it wasn't that many. So once a month? I can't say. I don't know. No. It could have been one a month. It could have been none for a period of a couple of months. It could have been a couple. I don't know. I'd be guessing. OK. OK, we can take that um, down then. Uh, can we go to your um, second witness statement and turn to the issue of the approach that you took to the provision of witness statements provided by Fujitsu to support post office prosecutions? And I want to start with the question of whether you were happy to provide such witness statements, whether you were content to do so. Can we look at your second witness statement, please, at page 16? And read paragraph 48, please. You say, I recall that Miss Baines was the main person responsible for performing um, ARQ data extractions for a time. Can you help us with who Miss Baines was? Uh, uh, Raj Baines. So that's Raj Binder Baines, is yes. that right? Yeah. To give her her full name. And you tell us that she was the main person responsible for performing the ARQ extractions for a time. Yes. Um, uh, but then did that change? Yes, it did. I mean, yes, there were a number of people who took that main responsibility. You continue, however, she did not want to be a witness in any court proceedings, and so I do not believe she prepared any witness statements. I got the impression she was nervous because it was something unknown to her, and the idea of going to court and being questioned was a bit daunting. Uh, just stopping there. Were they the only reasons that Miss Baines did not wish to provide witness statements? Uh, only, I, no, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I'm, not I'm not sure I ever had a proper conversation about it, but I do remember being nervous. It's not that type of outward person to want to do that. You continue, where post office requested a witness statement at the time of the ARQ request, I or someone else would therefore perform the data extraction and supply the statement. Um, if Miss Baines had performed the data extraction and post office later requested a witness statement, then I or someone else would re-extract um, uh, the data. Uh, so you, is this right, were not um, apparently afflicted with the same concerns that Ms. Baines was 
about giving witness statements um, and giving evidence and appearing in court. Sorry, afflicted? Yes. She, she um, didn't want to be a witness. She was, according to you, uh, nervous and didn't like the idea of going to court. You, you didn't suffer from any of those afflictions? Um, I wouldn't say I, I didn't, but I think I was probably a bit more confident than, than Ranger was at, at the time. Okay. You were happy to go to uh, court? Uh, firstly, happy to provide witness statements and then content to go to court, is that right? Um, yes. Yes. Did you uh, provide, were you provided with any training by Fujitsu or otherwise about the tasks that you were um, performing in extracting data, ARQ data, uh, obtaining HSD call records, and then writing witness statements and then appearing in court? We would have had training on the extraction uh, process for ARQs um, and HSD calls. I'm not sure I had training on that because that was my responsibility and I sort of managed that process. So if there was training, you'd be the trainer, not the trainee? Quite possibly, yes. Um, what about the other bits, the, the writing of witness statements and appearing in court? Any training from Fujitsu or otherwise on those? No, none at all. But what thought, if any, did you give to the role that you were performing and the fact that the evidence that you gave may have had a significant impact on people's lives? I don't recall my thought process at the time of, of generating those. Um, but I took that responsibility quite seriously. I, I mean, I was supplying data, uh, and I had to be happy with that witness statement. You said that you took the role quite seriously. Mm -hmm. What did you do in carrying into effect that state of mind? If you take something seriously, you sometimes do things accordingly. I what did you do accordingly? I would have done that task to the best of my ability and, and, and as thoroughly as, as I, I could. But what about the provision of evidence part of it, rather than being professional over the extraction of the ARQ data or the HSD call records? Was there anything in particular that you did when you were providing the evidence part of the function? What do you mean by providing the evidence part? I'm sorry. Well, you were writing witness statements. Yes. And then you were going to court to give evidence. Yes. Uh, you said that you took your role seriously. Was there anything that you did because you took your role seriously in the provision of the witness statements or the going to court to give evidence bits? I can't think that I did anything differently, no. I just performed the task that I, I did to the best of my ability, yeah. Okay. Can we look um, at some documents, um, please, um, and start by looking at FUJ 0022-5644. And look at page two, please. And if we scroll down, we've got the bottom part of the email. Can you see an email here um, from Lisa Allen to Phil Budd of the 29th of July 2009 concerning the Porters Avenue Post Office and the provision of a statement? Yes? Yes. Now, Porters Avenue, the Porters Avenue Post Office, I think you know that that was run by the sub-postmaster, Mr. Jerry Hosey, H-O-S-I. Yes? Yes. Before we get into the detail, because it's not a case that we've looked at um, in any substance before, I think it would be helpful to remind ourselves as to what happened in Mr. Hosey's case. Uh, 
So can we temporarily go away from this witness statement, uh, this email, and look at RLIT 40130? I think you'll recognize this as um, a judgment from the Court of Appeal. And if we just scroll down, it's dated the 7th of October 2021, and it's in the case of Ambrose and others, and one of the others was Mr. Hosey. And if we can look, please, at um, page 7, and scroll down to paragraph 33. I'm just going to read to get us all in um, mind of what happened in Mr. Hosey's case, because it's not a case we've looked at much. Uh, the Court of Appeal records that on the 12th of November 2010, in the Crown Court at Southwark, Mr. Hosey was convicted of one count of theft and three counts of false accounting. Uh, on the same day, he was sentenced to a total of 20 month, 21 months imprisonment. On the 5th of August uh, 2011, a confisca confiscation order was made in the sum of £3,500. And then 34, an audit of Mr. Hosey's branch identified a shortfall of 72,000 or so pounds. As a result, he and his son, Edom Hosey, who worked in the branch with his father, were interviewed under caution by post office investigators. Edom Hosey told the investigators that his father had four or five months earlier, before Edom started work at the branch, told him that there were unexplained shortages. He said his father was very careful about money as he had worked hard to make a success of the business. 35, in his own interview, Mr. Hosey said he'd experienced discrepancies at the branch since he became the sub-postmaster. He couldn't understand how the losses were occurring. He complained about the lack of support from the Horizon helpline to which he had request, uh, reported the apparent losses. He said he'd inflated figures for cash on hand because he didn't have sufficient cash to cover the apparent losses. He denied stealing money and blamed the losses on the Horizon system um, over the page. As Mr. Hosey had blamed Horizon, and as the post office investigators arranged for Fujitsu to undertake um, a hard drive analysis, the court had been provided with an extract from the report of the analysis by Phil Budd of Fujitsu, uh, from which the court inferred that the results were inconclusive. The court said, the extract does not strike us as supporting a prosecution. ARQ data was obtained for the period 10th of August 2006 to the 29th of November 2006 and disclosed to the defence. Emails going back to May 2005, five months before the indictment period, indicate that Mr Hosey had told Post Office about, quote, major problems balancing, such that he needed, quote, urgent face-to-face -face help. Post Office accepts it's not clear whether this material was disclosed. Logs from the post office MBSC show that Mr. Hosey made numerous calls categorized as, quote, horizon balancing. The defense obtained expert evidence to challenge the horizon evidence. An accountant's report stated, quote, in the interviews, it's clear that post office proceeded with a predetermined view that Mr. Hosey had stolen the allegedly missing money. Other possibilities have been, uh, been ignored. In particular, it's not been explored whether there was any missing money in the first place. In other words, no work has been done to ascertain whether the cash imbalance was because of the amount physically, because the amount physically to hand was too low, as the post office alleged, or because the amount shown on the IT system was too high. The defence also instructed an IT expert, although there was correspondence complaining about disclosure, it appears the defence were able to view the material they wanted, though we note that the defence complained about the amount of time they were afforded to do so. Gareth Jenkins was instructed by post office to respond to the expert evidence, but no formal expert report or witness statement appears to have been prepared by him. He wasn't called as a witness at trial in the event post office relied at trial on evidence from Phil Budd and others. Uh, post office accepts this was an unexplained shortfall case and that the evidence from Horizon was essential uh, to the uh, prosecution case. Post office accepts that the prosecution of Mr. Hosey was both unfair and affront to justice. A conviction was quashed on all four counts. So that's a reminder of what Mr. Hosey's case was about.
Can we go back to the email, please? Um, FUJ 0022 5644. Page two. Bottom email. Uh, Lisa Allen to Phil Budd. Um, Lisa Allen, is this right? Um, she was an investigation manager in um, the post office. I don't know what her role was, no. You, you I don't. can't, sorry, I can't remember what, what her role was. Okay. She gave evidence uh, to this inquiry back on the 20th of December 2023 and told us that she was at this time an investigation manager in the post office. Um, Phil Budd, he was a colleague of yours, is that right, at Fujitsu? It's a colleague. He worked on the account, but I didn't have day-to-day -day dealings with him. If we just scroll up, I think we can see his signature block, that he was a development, an RMGA, development systems engineer. Uh, was that somebody who um, didn't work in the same team as you then? Yes. Okay. Anyway, Miss Allen says... Uh, let's read her email. Phil, sorry for getting, uh, not getting back to you. We had another hearing and the trial has been adjourned for further inquiries as the defence want an expert to analyse the equipment and they need to get funding. Thanks for the statement. I'll forward it um, to our legal team. So it seems Ms Allen was saying there'd been another hearing and adjournment of the trial for a defence expert report and a thanks for the witness statement. And if we go um, back to page one, please. Uh, foot of the page. Uh, you'll see at the foot of the page that exchange, thank you, is forwarded to you. Uh, morning, Andy. Uh, that court case uh, reared its head again a few weeks ago. You remember I analysed a couple of counters back in July 07. Then you got me to sign a new witness statement in June 08. Well, they came back again and wanted me to sign another one, just a single paragraph, to say that the counters were, quote, in full working order and would not cause a discrepancy. I was not happy with the implications of full, full working order, since I did not perform test transactions on the counters. So I provided a new paragraph to reiterate my previous statement, that the files thereon were correct and the counters should be expected to perform as required. The reason for my email, now the defence are hiring an expert to analyse the equipment, I just wanted to make sure that the post office account are not relying, sorry, not solely relying on my analysis. I assume we've supplied evidence of the transactions going through and the systems working correctly. I'm just trying to reduce the stress I feel whenever this pops back into my head. Do you know why Mr Budd was not happy with signing a witness statement which said that the counters were in full working order and would not cause a discrepancy? No, I mean, I, I can't remember this email, but I would only taken my understanding from reading the email. You wouldn't have had a discussion with him about, um, come on, Phil, why don't you just sign the witness statement? What's all this worry about <coughs> saying oh. why, uh, uh, saying that the counters are in full working order and wouldn't cause a discrepancy? A conversation, on, well, I don't remember having conversations with him, but I would certainly not have had a conversation along those lines, no. If we just scroll up, please. You forward this to Peter Sewell, saying, I think you need to be made aware of what Phil has been asked for. Uh, he uh, was your manager, is that right? I think, uh, yes. He replies at the top, um, Phil, your statement is fine and is all you can actually say. If they stump up the cash, the counter equipment can, won't be of much use as the 40 day, 42 days retainer of the message store 
is long gone and will be endorsed by Gareth. Do you know what that means? You decode what's being said there, please, by Mr. Saul. The only thing I can deduce from that is that, that after 42 days, the message store is no longer available. The other parts I probably wouldn't have been involved in. Just go back down to what um, Mr. Bud's worry was, if we keep going, thank you. He says he was not happy with the implications of saying in a witness statement that the counters were in full working order. And he says that he felt stress whenever this popped back into his head and seemingly was stressed again because the defense were now instructing an expert. Would you agree that overall, um, this wasn't a complete refusal to provide a witness statement like Ms. Baines, but that Mr. Bubb was anxious to make sure, firstly, that the witness statement he signed did not go beyond what he actually could say? Yes. And secondly, that other people with knowledge of other areas of the system should carry out their investigations properly and not put the burden on him to say something that he could not himself say? I'm not, well, no, I don't believe it says that, he, that, that he's stating that other people should carry out their work properly, um, but there are other areas that can be um, looked at or used. The okay, so data. other people should, if um, uh, the expert report is going to be commissioned by the defence, other people in the post office account uh, should not rely solely on his analysis. Post office account should supply evidence of the transactions going through. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure what... Uh, I don't know what he was thinking, whether the, he thought he was the only person. I, I, I can't... Well, at the very least, would you agree that this kind of email of Mr. Budd being careful should have alerted you to the need for yourself to be careful about what you could and could not say for yourself in a witness statement? I don't know. I don't know. I can't remember what I, I took from that. I'm sorry. But this is, on the face of it, a, um, a systems engineer saying, I'm only uh, going to be prepared to speak to the matters that, about which I have personal knowledge. Of the testing that he carried out, yes. And that I'm not prepared to say that the counters were in full working order and couldn't or would not cause a discrepancy, i.e. give some master opinion about the counters and their working. Well, no. He's saying that he didn't, he couldn't do that because he hadn't put, um, from a testing perspective, he hadn't carried out those particular tests. And in fact, as we're going to see, you gave witness statements that were in part based on conversations which you had with other people in the SSC in particular, weren't they? Yes. And your witness statements were based on what uh, you say people in the SSC had told you, weren't they? Yes. But uh, what they told you was not attributed to them in your witness statements, was it? No, it wasn't. Instead, it was presented in your witness statement as if you were speaking from your own knowledge and expertise, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Did you realise when you were undertaking um, that task, going off to speak to or speaking down the phone to people in the SSC, writing things in your witness statements that were based on what they were telling you, about which you had no clue yourself, that you were blurring lines? So what's the, sorry, the question... Yeah. When you were doing this, writing witness statements that were in part based 
on what other people had told you. The facts themselves, you yourself, could not speak to from your own personal knowledge. Did it occur to you that you were blurring lines? No. No. Had anyone told you or given you guidance that it was acceptable to essentially speak on behalf of SSC staff without revealing that that was what was going on in your witness statement? No, no, no. No one had explained that I had to, uh, oh, I must say it wasn't just SSC. No one explained to me that I had to state where I gained that knowledge from. Can we go um, back to your witness statement, please? Uh, page 19. This is second witness statement. Page 19, paragraph 60. Paragraph 60, you tell us that one person from the SSC who I do recall interacting with concerning litigation support was Anne Chambers. I recall sitting in a witness waiting room with Anne Chambers for a couple of days prior to us both giving evidence, which I thought was the Old Bailey, but now understand would more likely have been the Lee Castleton proceedings at the High Court. My recollection is that after that case, Miss Chambers did not give evidence in court again and that Mick Peach did not want any of his team to go to court. The inquiry has provided me with a copy of an email from Mick Peach dated the 7th of August 2007 with the subject uh, requests for data and calls in which he describes an incident the previous year in which an SSC staff member ended up in court and says that, quote, the SSC is not in a position to undertake this role. In fact, the whole email, I'm just going to quote it without um, reading it, um, went on to say, it may be that the underlying issue is a lack of resource of a particular kind in the security team, someone who has both the technical knowledge to retrieve and understand the data and who is capable of supplying the analysis in the correct legal terminology to the post office. Was Mr. Peach right in that respect, that within the security team there was a lack of resource of a person who, or people, who had the technical knowledge to extract the data on the one hand, but were also capable of supplying analysis of the data in court proceedings? No, I don't. At, at, at that time, no, I don't believe that there was. In my in my role within supplying those witness statements and the uh, and the calls call log data, no, I don't believe I did. Um, in in that um, email, the one that's cited on that page, there, uh, Mr. Uh, Peach suggested that. Um, Gareth Jenkins could fill the gap. Uh, do you remember, however, that when it came to the Seema Misra trial, Mr Jenkins deferred to you over the uh, reading of the help desk logs? What, during the Misra trial? Yes. No, I don't remember that. No. You don't remember that? Okay. In any event, you've told us in your witness statement that you um, passed on what people told you in the SSC in terms of analysis of HSD calls. Is that right? Um, sorry, I was trying to listen to the question. Yes. Again. In, in your witness statement generally, you yeah. tell us that you um, went to the SSC and spoke to them or called them yeah, ask was, yeah. them for assistance at times, on, yes. on what entries in HSD logs meant and whether or not 
what was recorded there would have had an effect on the operation of the Horizon system? Yes. And you presented that in witness statements as if that was from your knowledge and understanding and your own analysis. In the light of that, did you think that it was appropriate, given the SSC's reluctance to undertake that function themselves? No. I, they don't want to go to court either and explain their own entries on records. And instead what's happening is you're phoning them up, asking what entries mean, presenting it as if it's your analysis, but without saying so. Um, no, I don't believe I saw it along those lines. I, I saw it along the lines through a, a, any an investigation or any reading of any literature or, or documents or speaking to people. One, once I've spoken to those people or asked questions about this, that and the other, um, I had that not, I, I had that understanding. So it, so, so it was within my, at that time, it was within my known knowledge. So because somebody tells you something, you're allowed to repurpose it as your own knowledge in a witness statement and evidence in court. Is Re that what you're saying? Repurpose? Yeah, as if it's your own knowledge. Well, no, it was, it, it, I, I then understood it, and then I considered it uh, that I knew then that. Did it ever occur to you, or did you ever think, why is it that I'm speaking to what the SSC are saying, and yet the SSC don't want to go to court themselves? No, I, don't, I didn't see it like that, no. Did you think at all as to why the SSC don't want to go to court anymore? I can't remember my, my thought process, but I do remember that Mick Peach was quite protective of his team in, in all respects of doing things. Did anyone decide that it was acceptable for you to essentially provide SSC evidence in court so that they no longer had to answer for their work, their own work, in witness statements or in oral evidence? Did a manager sign this off and say, look, Mick Peach is being protective over his team. He's not letting them go to court. I'm being put up instead. I chat to the SSC and I say what they would have said if they had gone to court. Well... Did anyone sign that off? Sign it off? Um, but I if, if you're saying sign off as they were aware that that's what I was doing and so they accepted uh, that I was able to do that well well yes because uh, I mean I would have had discussions with that and I think some of the documentation I'd, that they were aware that that's what I would be doing when I say sign it off I mean give um, explicit approval to it rather than being aware that it goes on I, I know that many mobile phones are stolen on the streets of London every day that doesn't mean I approve of it well, I would have taken approval or signing off that they are aware that I was doing that so I mean if they didn't think I should be doing it they would have said I shouldn't be doing it Was there a relationship between Mr Peach being protective of his team saying that they um, aren't to go to court anymore and you taking a greater role and effectively giving some of the evidence that they would have given? I don't think so, no, I, I don't believe so. I can't remember that, that. Thank you. So we're about to turn to a different topic. Uh, might we take the break until 25 past, please? Yes, of course. Thank you, sir.
Uh, good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Donks, can I turn to the issue of the extent of the analysis that went into the HSD logs? And can we look at how you describe this in your second witness statement at page 18, paragraph 57? Page 18, paragraph 57. Thank you. Uh, you say, in respect of the HSD calls, as part of my due diligence when analyzing whether there could have been an impact on the integrity of the data, I would consult with colleagues who had come across the issues before or who had a greater technical knowledge than me, such as the Software Support Center, the SSC, uh, to better understand the nature of the issues being raised and how they were resolved. Can you please explain your approach to what you describe as due diligence in providing evidence about whether phone calls to the HSD might demonstrate an issue that went to system integrity? So what was the last bit of that? Yes. The, the Can you explain the approach that you took i.e. Um, on what, uh, what prompted you to make a call to the SSC, what level of concern in what you read on a call log would I, cause you to uh, go to the SSC? Um, you call I, it due diligence here? Yeah, due diligence. I, I, w I would have carried out um, investigation and, and looked through each of the calls um, <clears throat> so we stop there. You say that you would have carried out an investigation. What did your investigation consist of? Um, well, I'd have printed out all the calls in, in detail or printed them out. I'd have read through the calls. So uh, printing and reading them? Yep. Yeah, step by step and looking at the calls. Um, if there was an area in then there that... I didn't quite understand what was going on or what was um, how it's being resolved. Um, I would consult whoever I believed at the time would have been able to, able to help me understand what was going on. How did you identify that person? Um, just through knowledge of who within the account could help me with that, that information. What does that mean? Did you go back to the person in the SSC that was mentioned in the call log? Uh, do, do, do. I can't remember if that's what I did because the SSC team changed. Um, I may have done. I may have done on a, uh, at times, but that wasn't always the case, no. Would you phone them? I'd phone them, uh, or um, no, not really. I, I didn't do a lot of over the phone. I would a lot of the time I would go up to the sixth floor where the SSC were based and speak to them personally because I had a lot of dealings with them on lots of other uh, issues to do with um, other roles within our uh, security team. And so you would go and speak to somebody. You can't remember how you identified who the somebody was. No, I don't, no. Would it be who ha whoever happened to be on shift, on duty at that time? More than likely, yes. Did you make a record of the conversation that you had with that person? No. I it, made, made, may have made, sorry, I may have made notes of what... Um, on the resolution or what I needed, yeah. But no, I didn't make a record of the conversations, no. Did you know whether you were required to make a record of your conversation with the person to whom you spoke 
where what they told you was essentially going to form part of your witness statement? No, I wasn't aware, no. I take it that you didn't think that you needed to do so, even though your witness statement was going to be placed before a criminal court? No, I didn't. I wasn't aware I needed to, no. And you personally, would you agree, couldn't say whether the thing that you were being told was actually right or wrong? I don't know. I, ha I had to... Would you agree, Mr. Dunks, that you, from your own perspective, could not say that what you were being told was right or wrong? I, 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 I don't know, because I, these are the people who dealt with, with these calls, so I would have to rely, sorry, rely on their, their own knowledge. I mean, if they didn't know... Isn't that they, the answer, then? Sorry? You, you, you yourself couldn't know whether what they were telling you was right or wrong. Um, you just said I would have to rely on them. Yes, I, I suppose so, yes. That's why you were actually speaking to them, because you didn't know the answer yourself. I didn't know the answer prior to the investigation. No, I didn't. Prior to speaking to them, yes. you didn't know yeah, the answer. Yeah, no, correct. So I think we've agreed that you couldn't yourself say whether what the SSE were telling you was true or false. I suppose so, yes. Why did you want to speak to colleagues about whether a record of a call might suggest a system issue with Horizon? Because I would have to defer to someone who's got a, a far greater technical knowledge than, than I did. We've addressed whether you thought that you needed to make a record of what they were telling you. Did you uh, know, w one way or the other, whether you had to explain in your witness statement that uh, what you were telling the court was in fact not based on your own knowledge, but was what somebody had told you? Two things there. Firstly, I wasn't aware and never been made aware that if I'd spoken to somebody uh, to gain that knowledge, that I had to state that. Um, and <clears throat> secondly, uh, as I said bef before, I read that part of the witness statement as within my own knowledge. And if I'd done research or investigated something, I, at that time, I would have had that knowledge. That's from, I knew about it. Who did you depend upon, if anyone, to give you advice on those, sort of, those sorts of issues? i.e. whether it was permissible to speak to somebody in the SSC, if you did speak to somebody in the SSC, whether you had to make a record of the conversation, and that if you did speak to somebody in the SSC, you should disclose that transparently on your witness statement. I, w I don't know. I, 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 I would have relied on management, my, my line management. They are aware of what I was doing. And uh, can you name names, please? Well, I would, I would have said my, any of my, um, uh, the security managers at, at the time. I mean, I, I think I've listed the ones that I re remember. Um, the Brian Pinder, Pete Saul, Donna Monroe, off the top of my head at right this moment. Did you have access to legal advice within Fujitsu? I, 
Uh, I'm not sure. I wasn't made aware that I did. So, I'm, but if I did, I'm sure. No, I wasn't aware. Were you aware that there were lawyers within Fujitsu? I think so. I'm not, I can't say when or I was aware or did know. No, I don't. Uh, did you ever um, seek advice from lawyers within Fujitsu over any of the matters that I've um, asked you about? No, I didn't. Did, um, to your knowledge, any of your managers um, ever seek such advice over people in your security team providing evidence that was based in part on what other people had said who themselves were refusing to go to court? I'm, no, I'm not aware anybody did. Uh, can we look at um, something else you did in order to... Um, as part of the process in satisfying yourself that calls either did or did not have an impact on the integrity of data. And look at page 38, please. And it's paragraph 115, which is towards the bottom of the page. You say, where there was a possibility that the issue being raised could have affected the data, I examined the records of the investigations carried out by the engineers assigned to deal with the call to confirm that they had either determined there was no impact or that a fix had been deployed to remedy any fault. Where, where I was unsure of anything, I would consult colleague, with colleagues who had come across the issues before or who had greater technical knowledge than me, such as the SSC, to better understand the nature of the issues being raised and how they were resolved, to satisfy myself that it had no impact on the integrity of the data. You describe here the way that you went about satisfying yourself that what was recorded in call data did not have an impact on the integrity of Horizon data, yes? Yes. Who told you that you were supposed to satisfy yourself that call data did not have an impact on the integrity of Horizon data, like what was recorded in the help desk records? I don't think anybody said that I had to satisfy myself. I don't think anybody's used those words to me, no. Did you see it as your role in the security department to give such an assurance no impact on integrity of Horizon data? In supplying the witness statements, I would have had to satisfy myself because of the wording within the, the witness statement. I'd have been had to satisfy myself that there wasn't any impact. I'm asking... Um, did you therefore see it as your role in the security department to give assurances that what you'd read in the call logs could have had no impact on the integrity of Horizon data? I didn't, I, I didn't see it as... Well, yes, I saw it as my role because I was supplying the witness statement, so yes. Did you ever provide a witness statement in all of your years in which you said that a call record did challenge the integrity of Horizon data? I don't believe I did, no. Did you ever provide a witness statement in all of your years in which you said that what was recorded in an HSD call record even possibly challenged the integrity of Horizon data? No, I didn't, no. So it was all one way. Nothing you ever read over decades ever even possibly called into question the integrity of Horizon data. Through my, no, I didn't, through my investigation, no, I, I didn't. I satisfied myself that it didn't, no. 
Can I look at a third aspect of your approach, please? Um, page 59 of your witness statement. paragraph 196, uh, you say, when I stated that quote, all the calls of a routine nature, just stopping there, that's a, a phrase that you use in, I think, all of the witness statements that you produced, i.e. every call that you ever read about was of a routine nature. Yes? Yes. So when I stated that all the calls are of a routine nature, I meant that these were the type of calls which were frequently made to the HSD and which I would regularly see when reviewing the call records. I note that some of the calls made to the HSD in respect of um, uh, this branch related to balance discrepancies that the sub-postmaster was stating were repeatedly shown on the system, etc. You say, I can't, uh, you say, I note that the calls were repeatedly referred by the HSD to the NBSC. I would therefore likely have understood this to be a commercial or user issue rather than a technical error. I'd often see commercial issues such as this being raised by the sub postmasters and then referred to the NBSC and therefore would have considered these calls to be of a routine nature. So can I summarize it that whenever you saw in an HSD record that the call had been referred to the MBSC, you believed that that was A, a call of a routine nature, and B, did not raise a technical error, a system error? Correct, yes. So that involved, would you agree, an assumption that the HSD were always right to refer the call to the MBSC? Uh, yes. And it involved an assumption that if the sub-postmaster thought that the discrepancy about which they were complaining was a result of a technical error, a system error, then they were wrong. If the call had been referred to the MBSC, yes, I would have seen that as a, a business commercial or, or a user error. Yeah. Um, and what I'm asking, Mr. Dunks, is that you're assuming that the person in the HSD has got it right and that the sub postmaster has got it wrong? Um, no. I would assume that they've been referred to there because they're assuming that it. Uh, first glance or whatever, that it could have been a business issue. If it turned out that further investigation would have been needed, that call, and I think I've seen it before, um, a call would have been passed back for further investigation to see if it was a, a technical issue. You were working on the basis that uh, Fujitsu, in its HSD, was correct in its categorization of issues as being commercial or business on the one hand and therefore referred to MBSC, weren't you? Yes, in a way, yes. Did you have access to and therefore the facility to examine when a call was referred to the MBSC? Sorry, say that again, what yeah. did I? Did you have access to and the facility therefore to examine what happened when a call was referred to the MBSC? No, we didn't. We didn't have access to the MBSC. So you don't know what happened after it had left the HSD? Uh, I, what they did and what they carried out, no, I don't. So if they, for example, just kept telling the person, turn your machine on and off again, you wouldn't know if that was the advice? No, I wouldn't. No, no. If they said to the person, under the contract, you've got to pay up this discrepancy, 
irrespective of you claiming that it's a system fault, you wouldn't know if that happened when it got into the MBSC? No. You wouldn't know that if they were told in the MBSC, um, clause 12 of the contract says that you must pay irrespective of fault for all losses. No. And many sub-postmasters did. And that the technical issue that they were complaining of therefore never reached the surface. You wouldn't know if that happened. I would have known if it needed further investigation, as in the fact that it may have been a technical issue, that, that call would have been passed back. What about if they were in the MBSC they were told, you just need to pay up? No, I don't know. I and know. You would write all of these up as being calls of a routine nature, which didn't involve the integrity of the Horizon data, wouldn't you, in your witness statements? It was a routine nature that, that those calls were passed to the MBSC, and we've seen them call that those calls routinely. Isn't what you were conveying by all the calls are of a routine nature was not about the frequency with which the calls were being made, but rather about the substance of the issues, i.e., these calls, you can be assured, uh, Mr. Defendant, Mrs. Defendant or court, that these calls do not involve a system issue. Repeat the question, sorry. Yeah. You weren't talking about the frequency with which the calls were being made by saying all of these calls are of a routine nature. You were implying that these calls did not involve any system issue with Horizon, weren't you? No, not one saying when they're routine nature. No, they would, as I said, as stated in there, that the, the contents or the type of calls were seen frequently. Might that not mean that there's a big system issue if you are frequently seeing calls of the same nature? No, I don't believe so, no. Why? Because the types of the calls that I'd looked at and, and, and seen... Sorry, the types of calls... The types of... The, the contents of, of the calls. I mean, that's what I'd base that on. Uh, can I turn that and come down? Thank you. Um, to your approach to HSD call logs, and in particular whether you summarised them or exhibited them, uh, did you always exhibit HSD call logs to your witness statements so that the raw materials were disclosed to the defence and to the court, or did you sometimes just summarise them in your witness statements? Sometimes just summarise them. And why did sometimes you give disclosure of the raw materials so that the court and the defence could actually look at them, and other times you didn't? That would have been dependent on what was requested by the post office. So sometimes they would just ask for a summary, and sometimes they would ask for the call logs to be exhibited? Correct. Do you know what determined, in their mind, whether it was a summary case or an exhibiting of raw material case? No, no idea. Was it chance no, for I a defendant which, one, which level of service they might have got? I have no idea. I don't know. I was just basing that on what they requested. I don't know why they would request one or the other. That, that's Did it ever occur to you, hold on, in some cases I'm actually handing over the raw product here as an exhibit, and in other cases I'm just summarising it? Why, um, why, why is that? No, I don't think it did. I, I knew full well that um, if the raw data, as in the, the, the complete call, was there and was available if requested at any time that they requested any data, it was, it was supplied. OK, can we look, please, at poll 307-3280? This is an exhibit sheet to your witness statement dated the 27th of... Uh, September 2006 in post office's claim against Lee Castleton. Can you see that? Yes. 
and we can see that um, it's your exhibit, um, APD1, Andrew, <coughs> Andrew Paul Dunks, I think that is. Yes. Um, and if we go over the page, please, can we see that you're exhibiting here HSD call records? Yeah, and if we just scroll down and just keep going, it can be done relatively quickly. Keep going. A series of HSD call records. Yes, so here you are in a civil case, in a civil context, exhibiting the call logs themselves. Yes? Yes. And do you agree that gives the reader the facility to record everything that is um, recorded on the call log itself? Absolutely, yes. Were there any hidden screens or hidden drop downs, or were they all available? Um, if you did a print to see? No, that, that is the, 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 the full contents of a call at the time. Thank you. Uh, can we look, please, at FUJ 3008-3702? Um, just look at the um, email first, and then we're going to look at the attachment. An email from Lisa Allen. I should say this is about Jerry Hosey's case again. Um, you'll see the email at the bottom, Porters Avenue Post Office. Andy has discussed, please can you provide another full statement for the above office, including uh, in the outcome of the faults reported that it would have had no effect on an, any counter discrepancy. I appear to have mislaid the original um, statement, and so we'll use the copy I have as unused. Additionally, can you exhibit the disk detailing the call logs. Yes? Yes. I just um, remember, for future purposes, the request at the end of the first line to include that it would have had no effect on any counter discrepancy. OK? Mm -hmm. And then can we look, please, at the attachment to... Um, sorry, you, you replied at the top, um, attaching a document. Can you see that? Yes. Um, please take a look and let me um, know if it's okay. Um, can we look at that attachment, FUJ 3083703? And if we scroll down, please. Um, and if we go to page two. Uh, you say um, in the fifth line, I've been asked to provide details and information on the calls for advice and guidance logged by HSH. That's the same as HSD, essentially. Is it? Yes. Uh, recorded during the period 1st of September 2005 to the 29th of uh, November 2006 for Porters Avenue. Then you give the FAD code. A report outlining each call was created and I produce the resultant CD as your exhibit APD01, and you say that was sent to the uh, post office. So you, in the Porters Avenue prosecution, um, seem to have been asked by the email to exhibit a CD with the full call logs in, on it. And in this um, witness statement, you do exactly that you um, exhibit the CD. Yes? Yes. And then if we scroll down, um, I've reviewed the HSH calls pertaining to that branch in that period. There were 33 calls, and, and there's the phrase, all the calls are of a routine nature and do not fall outside normal working parameters of the system. Um, and in my opinion, would have had no effect on any counter discrepancies. I know examine that, how that came about earlier, uh, later on, but you'll see that that's essentially the line that Miss Allen asked you to insert. Yes? Yes. And so in this case, if we carry on, 
scrolling, you then give a summary of each of the 33 calls by putting the date and time, a reference number, what the problem was, what the resolution in summary terms is recorded on the call log to be, and then the outcome. This first one was passed to the MBSC. Yes? Yes. Uh, that one does seem uh, maybe routine, check foreign currency rates, but the second one, uh, problem of failing to roll over, passed to the MBSC for resolution. So on that one, for example, would that fall within your category of because it was passed to the MBSC, that must have been a business or commercial issue. It can't have been a fault with Horizon because it was passed to the MBSC. Yes. Thank you. So that's one way of doing it. Here you've um, uh, summarized all that we've seen. Firstly, in the civil case, you um, exhibit a printout of all of the call records. Do you remember in Mr. Castleton's case? In this second example, you exhibit a CD of the call records and you summarize them in very summary terms, yes? Yes. Uh, can we turn, please, to what happened in the Seaman Misra case and uh, look at your witness statement, please? Um, second witness statement, page 57. Page 57, please. Uh, paragraph 192 at the foot of the page. You describe in this paragraph essentially how in each statement in the Misra case you gave more and more detail of the uh, HSD calls and that that was done at the request of the lawyers and the post office. Yes. And so this was more of an unfolding picture in the Misra case. Yes. Again, can you help us? What, what determined which approach you took? Whether you uh, did the first thing, gave them the printouts as part of an exhibit, whether you provided a CD with all of the call logs on it, or whether you summarised? It, it, it all would have depended on conversations and discussions with the post office, either investigator or, or lawyer. Um, there would have always probably been the starting point as in a, a high level overview of the calls. And then it would have progressed from there. But if the, the very first instant of, of discussions, they wanted the calls submitted and uh, uh, an in-depth overview, that's what would have been given at the starting point. Do you know how the, p the person that you were speaking to or engaging with on email from the post office knew what to request? Would they explain what prompted them to request more information from you? Mm, no, I don't think I don't think I remember having a conversation like that at all, no. I.e. whether it was because of what they'd read in what you had provided them, whether it was because the court was ordering them to provide more information, whether it was the defence asking for more information. What prompted the unfolding of the disclosure of more data? It could have been, e <laughs> it could have been either of what you've just said. It could have been where the, 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 um, the first... me first supplying a witness state to, uh, statement to them that they would have looked at it and reviewed it and come back and says, oh, we, we possibly need to expand here or there. 
um, <clears throat> or and also depending because I don't know what communications they were having with lawyers or whatever defense if um, somebody had asked for the full disclosure of the call details they would have come back to us and said oh, can we have those call details I'm no I'm not aware of the process they went through to who did you take your orders from? On the, the witness statements? Yeah. The, um, well, orders. It, it, first, it would have been uh, the request of the post office of what they wanted, any changes. Can we go back to Mr. Hosey's witness statement, please? Uh, FUJ 3008-3703. And look at page two, please. And look at the second paragraph down that we'd looked at. Thank you. I've reviewed the calls pertaining to Porters Avenue between those dates. There were 33, and all calls over a routine nature do not fall outside the normal parameters of the system, and in my opinion, would have had no effect on any counter discrepancies. In order to provide that opinion, had you spoken to anyone in the SSC in relation to any particular call or calls? I would have gone through the same process I would have done every single time and got as much information as I possibly could. Had you in fact spoken on this occasion in relation to any of these 33 calls to anyone in the SSC? My... No, I can't remember. I can't remember if I did. I honestly can't remember. But And you can't um, remember in part because it's not recorded on the face of the witness statement whether you did or didn't? Correct. And there's no other record of whether you did or you didn't? Correct. And so you can't tell us the extent to which the opinion that you formed there was or was not affected uh, or was influenced by the views of others? No, no. Can we go to page 13, please, of the witness statement? You refer in page 13 to um, two particular calls, one ending in 970. We just scroll down a little bit. Thank you. One ending in 970 and one ending uh, 008. And you say those two calls refer to a critical event uh, critical NT underscore error. The term critical is the comparative level of attention required to generate remedial action. It refers to the level of attention required on a grading system. For exam example, critical high level of attention or warning would be medium level of attention. These critical events occurred outside the post office opening times and a standard action of a reboot of the systems, which would also highlight any further issues, was undertaken and repaired the problem and confirm the stability of the system. Uh, I should add this is not my area, not my particular area of expertise. I have a general knowledge of these procedures and have made the comments above um, to aid the court. Where did you get that information from? I can't remember specifically where I got that, that information from. No, I can't say exactly where I got it from. Do you agree that you would have got the information from somewhere else? Yes. That wasn't your own personal knowledge? Um, part of that, yes. Yes, I agree. And so you're providing an opinion there, acknowledging that you're, this isn't your particular area of expertise, based on somebody else's opinion? Uh, no, I, I, oh, what you mean generally, or, or that those particular calls? 
Well, um, you say amongst the things that are included in that paragraph that the reboot of the system repaired the problem. Yes, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. Trying to, to explain what took place uh, for that call. OK, I'll move on. Can we look at poll 305? 2220. Um, this is an email chain in mid 2009 um, concerning your first witness statement in the Seema Misra case. Can we start with page four, please? And just scroll down. I think this is the first email in the chain. Uh, you're emailing Dave Posnett. Do you remember who Dave Posnett was? I believe he was an investigator or part of the security team within the post office. Thank you. It's the 22nd of June, 2009. I should say that your witness statement eventually, your first witness statement in Misra, came to be signed on the 30th of June, 2009. You say to Mr Posnett, hi, Dave. Uh, please have a look at the attached witness statement for West Byfleet HSA calls logged. Can you let me know if this is okay and I'll print, sign and post it um, to you. And if you go to page three, please. And if we scroll down, please. We'll see his reply on the 22nd. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and the statement looks fine to me though I've copied John Longman, the officer in the case, for his information. My only query would be that the log of 107 calls may need to be produced as evidence or be disclosed as unused material. If produced as evidence, then it could be incorporated in your statement now or produced in a further two statement later. I'll let uh, John comment on this, though, as the court may be happy as it is. John, can you give Andy the green light? and or comment on the thoughts above. So it seems that um, your statement mentioned 107 calls. You were um, picked up on this. And if we scroll up, please, we can see Mr. Um, Longman's reply. The statement is fine but the mention of 107 calls will no doubt interest the defence barrister. If possible, could you include in the statement a breakdown of the calls to cover time, date, nature of call? If we don't include it now, the defence will only request this um, information later. And then scroll up, please. Your reply, 107 calls may seem a lot, but that only equates to approximately three to four calls a month over the time frame. Just stopping there, is it right that you saw it as routine for branches to have to call the Fujitsu help desk three to four times a month, i.e. nearly every week? Routine? Well, I, I would have said so. I, at the time, I would have looked at the number of calls. I'd I've done, I would have done the maths and, and looked and, and through my knowledge of dealing with help desk calls, uh, one call a week, um, in my opinion, didn't seem that much. Did you use the frequency of the calls as a proxy for whether or not the substance of the calls was routine? The frequency at that time, I was just trying to explain. Overall, did you use the frequency of calls as a proxy for whether the substance of the calls was routine? No, I don't believe I did. So the frequency to you wasn't a relevant issue? Um, I, I don't know whether I'd have taken that into in consideration. Um, I'm, I was just talking about that. He'd made a statement about 107 calls seems a lot, so I was just 
I did the, the maths and sort of went back to him and, and gave my opinion that I didn't think it... OK, you carry on to add the information you want is going to take one to two days of uninterrupted work to complete. Uh, so to get it done is not impossible. You'll be cutting it fine. Um, if you need the extra detail, I'll inquire when we can get this uh, to you. And then if we scroll up to page two, please. Um, uh, John Longman says, let's run with the statements as it is. If the defence do want details of the 107 calls, then a further statement will be needed at a later stage. Uh, maybe you could add into your statement that the total calls only work out at three to four a month over the time period, and that is not a high amount for a post office. Again, would the substance of the calls make a difference as to whether the number was significant? At that time, I don't... I believe I was just giving an opinion that I didn't think that the, the frequency or the number, it, I don't believe at the time that was to do with the substance, it was the frequency, because he'd asked that there were, seems a lot of calls there, but it didn't, in my opinion, I didn't think that there was. And so I think you were content to provide a statement with the addition proposed by Mr Longman, because you reply, okay, I'll add this to the statement and get it posted, agreed? In, yes, yeah. So in summary, at this stage, you're not providing the substance of the calls. You're providing a witness statement that says how many there are and that that is not a high number. I don't know. I think that was an add-on because we've got the... I can't remember the details of what the first... that witness statement I supplied him with... OK, I can maybe check that to see um, what was... Yeah, no, I, I, yeah I, I don't know the progress uh, and how that... I can't remember how that worked. I uh, don't believe it was just a statement saying, oh, there was 107 calls. It... Uh, can we look at what happened after you signed the witness statement off on the 30th of June? Yeah, scroll up, please. Keep going. To page one, please. We see um, a chain that I don't think includes you between um, Penny Thomas, Dave Posnett, and John Longman. So, Fujitsu to two post office men. Um, Dave, an approximate estimate for the work is um, ARQ's 13,000 odd pounds, help desk individual breakdown, 1,800 pounds, call type breakdown, 630 pounds. Do you want? Uh, me to arrange a formal estimate. Was the level of information that you provided in the witness statement affected by the cost of the provision of it? Um, well, I never knew there was an individual cost. I don't believe I ever knew there was an individual cost of the work I was doing. I understood that the whole ARQ process um, was covered under an agreement uh, on based on payment on the number of ARQs we supplied. Um, I mean, I'd, I've, never, I, I've, I've never seen this. I, I don't believe I ever knew that someone was giving us uh, an estimate of cost or charging on the work I carried out. So if there was an effect of the... Um Le on the level of service provided uh, by reference to the amount that it costed, that information never found its way to you? Correct. And if we just scroll to the top of the page. Thank you. You can see that that chain doesn't um, then find its way on to you. So in summary, on this aspect of the um, uh, story, you just did what you were asked to do by post office, is that right? And didn't know the extent to which financial considerations affected the choices that they made? Absolutely, no. Thank you. Can we go on, please, to FUJ 0012 
This is still in the context of um, the Seema Misra case. And can we look, please, at the um, bottom of page one and the top of page two? Uh, just to scroll up a little bit more, please. Thank you. We can see we're December 2009, from you to John Longman. And can you say hi? See, you say hi, John. Please find below answers to the questions you asked. Could you confirm how you want to complete call information? So, how you want the complete call inf information? Do you want the whole call transferred to a CD in its raw state? There are over 100 of these. And then if we scroll up, please. And keep going. No more relevant information there. You appear to be querying in this chain in relation to your what would be your second witness statement, which you were to sign off on the 29th of January 2010, um, whether you should essentially exhibit the CD, is that right? Can you just, just scroll, scroll down? Please? Scroll down, please. Yeah. Right. And again, please. Maybe we should see the below questions. If we scroll a bit further. Oh. The answers haven't come out um, uh, in red. We just scroll back up, please. Thank you. Um, you say, please find below answers to the questions you asked. Confirm how you want the complete call information. Do you want the whole call transferred to a CD in its raw state? There are over 100 of these. Can you help us with what you were asking? I think that the please find below answers your questions, now seeing yep. the contents, they were to do with uh, answers about the counters which I'd passed on to Leighton Machen. Yes. And I then forwarded them those. Can you confirm you want, how you want to complete? That's probably through a discussion of supplying the call data. Uh, does he want them printed out or, well, I'm guessing there, sorry. That may have been to do with it. Did he want them all printed out and sent or does he want them all on a CD? It's just the, over how he wanted them. It is not whether or not the raw data should be provided. Uh, Absolutely not, no. Do you know why you wouldn't provide the raw data at this stage in one form or another? Um, well, dependent on the request that they, the post office wanted. OK, can we move forwards then to FUJ 0015-3059? Look, uh, thank you. Uh, scroll down, please. Oh, that's it, just there, sorry. Bottom of that last email. Just scroll up a little bit, thank you. Can you see, if we scroll up a little further, an email between um, Mr. Longman and um, Penny Thomas in the third paragraph. We're now on the 16th of March, third paragraph. We will need Andy to produce the disk containing the raw data of help desk calls from 1st of January 2005 to 31st of December 2009. And then if we go forwards, please, to poll 3058443.
and page seven, please. And scroll down. We can see a witness statement of yours dated the 30th of March. If you just scroll up, please. 30th of March, 2010. And you say, further to a previous witness statement, I provide a CD, AD01, containing details of all calls logged um, at West Byfleet between those two um, dates. So would this have been in response, essentially, to that email that we saw of the 16th of March? Exactly, yes. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming yes. That worked its way through to you somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, does it follow that at least from um, at this date, uh, Mrs. Misra's defence team had available to them the underlying call data upon which your earlier summaries were based? Yes, I think so, yes. Can you help us with what would have been on the CD as AD01? I'm guessing, or I'm assuming it would have been as we saw before, the call logs in their entirety. Okay, so a series, one after the other, of 107 call logs between those two dates. Correct. Thank you. So that's an appropriate moment um, for the second break. I wonder whether we could break until 25-2. Yeah, before we do, in case I've missed it, and it's in my head, uh, Mr. Dunk, did you give oral evidence in Mr. Hosey's case? In which case, sorry, sir? Mr. Hosey, Mr. Jerry Hosey. That's Porter's Avenue, is it? Um, yeah. I don't believe I did, no. All right, thank you. Yeah, fine. Yes, 25 past. Uh, but sorry, what, what time did you say? 25 Mr. 2, please. 25 2, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, Dunks. You remember that I asked you about that email exchange in mid-2009 concerning Seaman Misra's case, in which you had provided a witness statement saying that there had been 107 calls to the help desk, and um, this was picked up and you were asked for more information because otherwise the defence barrister will only ask for it. And there was a question over how detailed your first witness statement had been, the witness statement that had been served on the 30th of June 2009, you said you don't think you would have just included the number in the witness statement, or words to that effect. But can we look at that witness statement, please? Poll 3051960. This is your witness statement. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, witness statement of the 24th of June 2009, which was served under a notice of additional evidence on the 30th of June 2009. Um, if we just scroll down, we can see um, some standard paragraphs. Uh, no need to read all of those. We're going to come back to the detail of these boilerplate paragraphs um, later. And then at the bottom of the page, you say an important element of the support provided to sub postmasters and counter clerks is the Horizon help desk. Um, it um, is the Horizon user's first port of call, etc. And then six lines in, five or six lines in, you say, I've been asked to provide information pertaining um, the working condition of the Horizon system. I think that must mean I have been asked to provide information pertaining to the working condition of the Horizon system. The following information constitutes the calls logged by HSH uh, for West Byfleet between uh, June 30th of June 05 to the 14th of January 08. I've reviewed the calls um, between that period. There are 107 calls. This equates to between three to four calls a month, which is average for this size of post office. All the calls are of a routine nature and do not fall outside the normal working parameters of the system um, or would affect the working order of the counters. I think that must mean nor would they affect the working order of the counters. Um, so I think, in fact, you did provide a very short witness statement that just gave the number and the opinion rather than any more information. Is that right? 
uh, did pay, so yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, was that a standard approach to provide a summary of the number and an explanation of what HSH was and then put the opinion at the bottom and then wait to see what happened? Um, there was... Uh, there was no standard approach. I mean, once we had re received a request from the post office for help desk calls, <coughs> excuse me, help desk calls, um, there would have been a discussion or request of what they wanted um, at the time. So it would have been on their request of what was supplied. So we, we saw earlier in Mr. Hosey's case, you provided a summary that yep. ended up being a 13-page witness statement, and you cut into the witness statement um, bits of the call logs. And again, j just one last time, what determined what the entry-level point was, i.e. the first statement you provided? The re on the request of the post office, what they wanted. And did you have any clue as to what was motivating them? What was influencing them as to what to ask for? None whatsoever, no. Okay. Can we uh, turn to a separate issue then, namely what the standard paragraphs in the witness statement, what I've described as boilerplate paragraphs, uh, meant or were intended by you to mean? Uh, can we look, please, um, to start with at FUJ 0015 5555? And if we scroll down, please. And again. That's it, that's the bottom of the chain, just scroll up. Thank you. Um, thank you. An email at this point not copied to you. It's about a witness statement. It's between Mr. Posnett, um, Mr. Hooper, and Mr. Um, Ward. Um, do you remember who um, Graham Hooper was? Graham Hooper was the security manager, I believe, at the time. And we see him described as CS security manager. Would that be customer support security manager? Um, yes, security came under customer support. Okay. As so it would he have been uh, a manager of you at the time? Yes. Thank you. And we know who Graham Ward is in um, the post office. Um, Graham, I think that's the Graham Hooper. Um, just a quick note to thank you for the above in relation to the Horizon system. This evidence was allowed to form part of the case and the defendant was ultimately found guilty of eight false accounting charges and one theft charge. I appreciate the fact you supplied the statement, especially given the short notice you received. And then scroll up, please. Um, Mr. Hooper forwards that on to Martin Riddell. Who was he? Not sure. I think was he in Fujitsu? Yes, he, I, I'm... I believe so, yes. And are there all the other people on the copy list there in Fujitsu? Yes. Um, he, Graham Hooper, says um, another good result supported by Horizon evidence, um, and you're included. Mm -hmm. And then if we scroll up, uh, Martin Riddell replies to everyone, uh, saying, well done to everyone involved. If I was a caring, sharing manager, I'd buy a drink for everyone involved but I'm not, so I won't. Were you involved at this early stage, 2002, September 2002, in the provision of witness statements for the purposes of Horizon-based prosecutions? I don't know. Um, I know I started in, on the post office account in 2002, I don't know when or how long I'd been working on the account at that time. And at this, no, I can't I'm say. so sorry. Sorry, no, I, 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 no, I can't recall if I had 
was involved in that? At this stage, um, September 2002, was there a standard form witness statement in use within the security team? I can't remember. I believe so, but I can't remember. Do you always, throughout your time, over the years, remember using standard form witness statements? Yes. Can we turn, please, to FUJ FUJ 0015-2505. FUJ 0015-2205. Thank you. Uh, we can see on the top right, this is um, a copy of, an earlier copy of the policy concerning, Fujitsu policy concerning uh, prosecution support for network banking. Can you see that? It's yes. dated the 26th of November 2002. Remember the other one we looked at was dated the 29th of February 2005, earlier on. Incidentally on that, there's no need for people to write into the inquiry to say that the 29th of February 2005 didn't exist because it wasn't a leap year. Uh, we've had lots of emails over the course of inquiry pointing that out. Um, thank you to everyone. You can see that the abstract is, um, again, uh, of, of a similar type. The document outlines the end-to-end -end procedures required to manage and deliver network banking prosecution support. You can see who um, the contributors were at this time. Your manager, Mr. Hooper, Jan Holmes, and Richard Laking. Can you help? Mm, no, I don't recall. Um, and... If we look, please, um, at the approval authorities on page two. And scroll down, please. I think we can see that um, in the box in the middle of the page there, under optional review, um, one of the options was Graham Ward. Can you see that? Yes. Um, he being a post office manager, yes? Yes. And it's asterisked which suggests that Mr. Uh, Ward did indeed um, uh, return a comment as a reviewer. Can you see that? Yes. And can we turn, please? Um, again, there's a passage in the um, body of the document which refers to a template witness statement of fact being um, annexed as an appendix to can we turn to that appendix two, please, um, which is on page 27. Uh, can we see that over um, that page, appendix two, witness statement of fact, and if we just scroll on uh, quite quickly if we can, thank you, and just on that page and then the next page, and it goes right up until page 32. And can you see again, each paragraph is headed by um, 
a capital letter. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. If we just quickly go back to page 21. And if we look, please, at paragraph 7.2.4.1. Thank you. <coughs> um, third paragraph, the statement shall follow the standard format and layout for witness statements of fact provided in evidence. Contents of witness statements of fact are flexible depending on the specific requirement of each case and the knowledge of the witness giving it, uh, the statement. An example of a witness statement of fact is provided in appendix two. D did you know about this policy that the um, company had produced a policy saying uh, an example of a witness statement of fact is provided in appendix two and a template witness statement was provided in appendix two. This was in the year that I joined. Uh, I don't know whether I actually was given this, this document to read. I, I don't remember seeing this, no. Can we go back please to page 31 within the template witness statement? Uh, page 31, uh, foot of the page, paragraph Q. Uh, you'll see that um, the boilerplate plate paragraph Q is there's no reason to believe that the, com the information in this statement is inaccurate because of the improper use of the computer. To the best of my knowledge and belief at all material times, the computer was operating properly or if not, uh, any respect in which in which it was not operating properly or was out of operation was not such as to affect the information held on it. I hold a responsible position in relation to the working of the uh, computer. Were you required to say that, what's in that paragraph Q in each and every case? Was I required? I don't know that the requirements were. In all of your witness statements, we see that paragraph. Yeah. Why did you include it? Because it was in the witness statement template that we had been told to use. How did you know whether it was true or false? These, well, actually, I don't, are these, are you talking about our Q? Um, witness statements? This appears in both species of witness statement, um, ARQ and HSH. Yeah, I mean, this, this, the overall of that is the best of my knowledge at the time. So I, I believe that everything was working as it should. How did you know it was? Well, in respect of ARQs, I knew that the, there was checks being made. Uh, every time we um, extracted data. And the, in respect of the HSD calls, it would have been um, looking in the calls and believe it is um, operating as, as it should and as it's expected. What's the it in that sentence? The... the um, the counters uh, and... So stop, stop there. You believe when you signed a witness statement that included that paragraph that it was testifying to your belief that the counters were working properly? Were working as expected, yes. And so I interrupted you. You, you said the counters and... Um, But the, 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 it's, it's trying to explain that the, the post, the branch and the counters were working as expected as to not to affect the integrity of the data. And so this is providing um, a view, uh, um, an opinion, um, an assessment 
on Horizon itself, in your mind? In respect of the, the branches and the integrity of the data, yes, in my opinion. And I'll ask again, how would you know whether that was true or false? I would have made that my opinion based on the, uh, the investigation that I carried out. How could you tell, how could you say there was no reason to believe that the information is inaccurate because of improper use of the computer? Uh, again, I mean, I, I made my, that assumption, my opinion, on an individual basis of every call that I looked at. And, uh, I, and I was being asked for an opinion, and that was my opinion. Can we turn to your um, inquiry witness statement, please, your second inquiry witness statement at page 33? Paragraph 96, page 33, paragraph 96. Foot of the page. You say the witness statements I supplied in respect of the production of ARQ records contain the following or very similar wording. And then you set it out. Yeah? I'm not going to reread it. Over the page, please. Over the page, please. I, you say in 97, I note that this paragraph is included in the template witness statement appended to the document we've just looked at, yes? Yes. What was the purpose of noting that there in paragraph 97? Will you just, can you help us? Um, I think that's an example of when it was used. You weren't saying by that paragraph that you drew the witness state, that part of the witness statement from that policy? Mm, no, I didn't, no. That I didn't. You just took it off the template that was on the system? It was, yes, it was included in the template, yes. Thank you. Uh, 98, you say, my understanding at the time was that I was confirming that I had not improperly used the audit extraction software to manipulate the data I was exhibiting, and that uh, as far as I was aware, the software had run properly when extracting the data. You see here in this witness statement, you're saying that you believed that the uh, boilerplate paragraph was referring to the audit extraction software? Yes. If we scroll down to page, uh, paragraph 100, you say, I did not believe I was verifying that the Horizon system as a whole was operating properly at all times, or that there could not have been any software errors that affected any of the information held within it. So you're here saying, firstly, do you agree, that when you wrote or included the paragraph in each of your witness statements, you had a positive understanding of what it meant and what it did not mean? Yes. And is that true, that you can remember that standard paragraph Q was one that you held a belief at the relevant time as to what it did mean and what it didn't mean? At the time of writing the statements, yeah, I would have had a yes. And that it was only limited to uh, the... Um, 
reliability or improper use of the audit extraction software and not relating to Horizon as a whole? Yes. And are you sure that that was your contemporaneous belief over each of the years when you were signing this template statement in prosecutions? I, yeah, I would have held that position, yes, I would have done. Can we look, please, at FUJ 0020-1401? FUJ 0020-1401. This is a transcript of your evidence to the High Court um, in the group litigation. It's dated the 20th of March, 2019. Can we go to page 28, please? Oh, I see, we're on 28, at the foot of the page. 28 at the foot of the page. Foot of the page, please. Uh, we can see where the transcript of your evidence begins. You're sworn. Yes. Can we go forward to page 41, please? Page 41. You're being cross-examined here by Mr. Militic. And can you see in the um, second question, third line, he says, and then paragraph eight again, I just want to be very precise. I want to make sure I understand exactly what's being said in this statement. Paragraph eight begins, there's no reason to believe that the information in this statement is inaccurate. Pausing there, what is this statement? Uh, carry on, thank you. Do you mean your witness statement? Yes. And then okay. And then there's no reason to believe that the information in this witness statement is inaccurate because of the improper use of the system. And the question is, what is the system there? Is that the system of the process of extracting audit data, or is it something else? So just stopping there, you can see that you're being asked very similar questions to the ones that I've asked already, albeit this is a different witness statement that contains the same boilerplate paragraph. So you're asked, what's the system there? Is that the system of the process of extracting audit data, or is it something else? And you say, good question. There's no, I'm not sure what I was meaning by that. There is no reason to believe, over the page. Uh, we'll take this step by step, and then it continues. So just stopping there, you were saying to the court that you didn't know what you meant you say, I'm not sure what I was meaning by the system and that there is no reason to believe. How is it that in 2019 you were saying on oath that you were not sure what you meant by the boilerplate paragraph, but now in your witness statement five years later, you tell us that you knew that it meant only the audit extraction software and not Horizon more generally? Um, looking at this now, now I'm going over it. I, I, I'm not sure what I was thinking at the time or what I was trying to remember. The questioning does continue. Um, I think I was meaning about the improper use of the audit data extraction system. 
question. So when you say system, you mean the process of extracting audit data? Yes, I do. And then it continues, I see. So then there's the quote. And then it goes on to um, uh, deal with a separate issue, namely what at all material times meant. So when you told the court that you weren't sure what you were meaning by the paragraph, the boilerplate paragraph, how is it that your memory seems to have improved five years later that you were definitely meaning throughout time only the system used to extract audit data? I, I don't know. I mean, being on, put on the spot at the time, um, I'm not sure I fully understood the question or, or whatever, but I, I'm not sure and I can't remember what my thought process was at the time. Thank you. Can we turn to a separate topic, please? Um, South Warmbra and uh, Mrs. Josephine Hamilton's case. Uh, this is dealt with in your second witness statement in paragraphs 183 to 189 on pages six, uh, 56 um, onwards. Uh, I'm not going to read um, what you say there. They're there for the record. But instead, can I take you to some email exchanges, please? Uh, starting, please, with FUJ 0022 5544. Can we look at the bottom email first, please? We're on the 13th of January, 2007. If we just scroll up. Thank you. Um, from uh, Mr. Ward to you about a witness statement that you had made in Josephine Hamilton's case. Uh, he says, Mr. Ward says, Andy, I've made one or two minor amendments uh, pull all the text into the same font, spelling of South Warmbra, and also put three question marks following some acronyms uh, so you can explain in full. I know some are explained later in the statement. To make things easier for a barrister and jury, any acronyms should be explained the first time they appear in a statement. Most of the explanations of the cause make sense to me, aside from the one below, which, to, uh, which appears to suggest a fault. Uh, can you simplify what this means. And you'll see that he identifies a call ending um, double 106. Can you see that? Yes. <clears throat> and then if we scroll up, please. You reply uh, later that day on the Saturday. Um, I will make the amendments on Monday but I had posted a copy of the statement on Friday just in case it was okay, so please um, um, ignore. Uh, can we look at the statement, please? Um, the one that you signed off on the 14th of January, 2007. Uh, poll 304 Uh, this is your witness statement of the 14th of January 2007 in uh, Josephine Hamilton's case. And can we look at page three, please? And um, if we scroll down to look for the call den ending in 1106, it's in the middle of the page there. It's got an asterisk on it. A new call, uh, this is the 21st of April 2004, taken by Richard Poston's critical NT error. Um, occurred at um, the device did not respond within the timeout period. Resolution, an automatic error event was picked up by the system management center, second line support, and a call was logged. The system management center referred to a KEL, a known error log. A remote reboot of the counter was carried out, which did not resolve the problem. A um, priority call was raised. You give the number 
uh, to contact and advise the postmaster for a manual reboot, call closed by Kevin Pearson. So that's the one that um, Mr. Ward was saying, that that tended to indicate a fault. Yes? That, yes, that's what he's saying. And he was asking for clarification. Yes. Uh, you don't, um, I think, provide clarification here, do you? Um, I don't, well, I haven't got an email with it on. I don't know whether I spoke to him regarding that. Well, in the witness statement, you don't, do you? If we just carry on scrolling through to the end, because sometimes you, at the end of the witness statement, uh, have a, a mop-up paragraph dealing with any possible faults. And so it ends. So he was saying uh, this fault on the HSD log, sorry, this entry on the HSD log is suggestive of a fault and asking whether that call did describe a fault. And you don't address it, do you? Not, no, no, no not in the, in the final witness statement, no. And uh, not in your email either, did you? Not by email, I didn't, res well, it doesn't appear that I responded back to him with it, no. If we go back to page three, and look at the entry, it says that a remote reboot was carried out, which didn't resolve the problem. A priority was raised, priority call was raised, and advice for the postmaster for a manual reboot, and then the call was closed. So on its face, it doesn't res um, record that there was any resolution to the problem, does it? Just that the call was closed. No, the advice was to contact, uh, raise another call to get the postmaster to do a manual reboot. Yeah, and it doesn't record whether that was successful, does it? Uh, not on that particular call, no. On any other call? Well, th the following call was raised an A priority, which was the, the next call in line. Uh, and the, it appears that the reboot didn't solve the issue, so an engineer was sent to swap over the base unit. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at the call ending in 0123? Yes. So the question that was asked of you by the investigator was whether it disclosed a fault, and you didn't answer it, did you? Well, I'm, I'm not by email, no. Or in your witness statement? Well, no, because uh, at the time I would have, an investigation, the work I'd done on that, looking into the, the Sorry, course, you said you would have done an investigation. What investigation would you have done? I would have carried out the same investigation that I would have done for any witness statement at any cause. I would have spoken to people, I would have looked at things to clarify that I was happy to make that statement. What would you have looked at? Anything available for me? Such as? Um, I mean, that's got coal, uh, uh, Kells you reference would have in there. Kells, would you? I would have done, yes. There are two Kells mentioned there, aren't there? Yeah. One R. Coleman ending in 3J and one P. Carroll ending in 9Z. Aren't there? Yes. And so you would have gone off and searched up those two known error logs, were you? would you? Yes. And what being satisfied that what was disclosed on those known error logs um, itself didn't assist in um, saying that there either was or was not a fault in uh, Josephine Hamilton's branch being reported on this occasion? I would, yeah, I would have looked at each of them both of those Kells, and, uh, and again, 
the same as I would have done with the help desk calls. If I didn't understand the clarity, I've got some clarity from the SSC because the KELs are written by the SSC to understand what's the wording and the steps and what it's trying to explain. So looking at um, the first KEL, uh, R. Coleman ending in 3J, can we look at that please? FUJ 3059070. Can we see that's the um, Kel R. Coleman ending 3J? Yes. And can you see, if we scroll down the problem, NT has detected a fault on disk drive or ID controller, and then there's some code. Can you tell us what all that code means, please? Uh, now, no. I, I can't recall what everything there says or means no. Would you have been able to understand all of that code at the time? Well, I'd, yes, I would have done. I, well, I say understand, I'd have got a knowledge of, of what that all meant, yes. How would you have got a knowledge of it? By, as I said, speaking to the, so, someone within the SSC. They're there, these are their words and they're their um, no error log, so they the, would have written them. They're the expert, not, not you? Yes. And they were the experts that didn't want to give evidence? Yes. Uh, solution, help desk. Uh, first check for other events which may have led to this error, such as a bad block or corrupt storage unit events. If such events exist, follow the appropriate KELs for those. Uh, to test if the error is simply as a result of processor delay, due to intensive processing by the counter at the time of the event, reboot the counter. If the error recurs, this is indication of a more serious fault, either with the computer's motherboard or the effective drive. Therefore, if the message reappears, then send an engineer to replace um, the part at fault. And so it, you can see it continues. And then if we look at the second KEL that's referred to, FUJ 0005 um, the one ending uh, P Carol 9Z uh, problem. Scroll down, please. Thank you. Corruption on message store, likely to be a bad disk or more likely repost has been subjected to an interruption whilst an indexing operation has been taken place. If a power outage occurs during this process, it's possible for corruption of the data structures within Repost. A solution, a reboot can fix some of these problems, so that should be tried in the first instance. If the event occurs out of hours, then clear desk may clear the problem. If they persist or reoccur and the post office are having problems, then do something. And then further down, about eight lines in, multi-counter sites, SMC must check all counters are working okay, apart from target counter. There must be at least uh, one other unit with a fully functioning repost present. Um, if not passed through SSC, etc. So reading the entry on the um, help desk and reading these two KELs, which you say you would have done, how were you able to say that what you read um, did not disclose anything other than the system operating properly? Again, from my understanding of discussing, I mean, I would have asked... I would, I'd had discussions with it, someone within the SSC to, to explain what was going on. We'd looked at the call to, to see what the steps were. Um, and, the, I mean, this is a known error log, so these errors have been seen before. Is that a good thing? Well, there's always going to be certain errors, that, and how they're, they're dealt with. It's, it's how they're dealt with is, is the, 
the process. And how were you able to say that this had no effect on the properation of Horizon? Well, no, the proper effect on, on the counters, I mean, it was still working as expected. There may have been fo a, a fault at the counter, but again, that's within the boundaries and integrity of the Ryzen system. I believe, in my opinion, that at the time, it was working as it should do, and there wouldn't have been any um, integrity issues with the data between the branch and, and the Horizon. Did you look at the data to see whether there were any integrity issues? At the data? Yeah. No. Thank you. So uh, that would be an appropriate moment um, for lunch if it um, is acceptable to you. I wonder whether we could break until 10 past 2. Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you very much. <laughs>